Jeez, there's so much carpet. We'll never be able to get it all out of here. Besides, why should we rip off something which costs so little? No fence would give us a good price. He could buy it at Russell's at such bargain prices. That's right, Harry. Rosso's Carpet Warehouse is offered direct warehouse to consumer low, low prices. Each Rosso's Carpet Warehouse is stocked with over 100,000 square yards of quality carpet, including 100% nylon shags and DuPont high lows, the very lowest prices on quality carpeting. Complete delivery and installation available. Use your Bank AmeriCard or Master Charge. Financing also available. Don't miss this fabulous introductory offer. Carpets up to $14.95 as low as $3.25. None over $6.85 on our entire $3 million inventory. If you don't shop Rosso's, it can cost you money. It's a steal. KNXT Channel 2. That's a Lancaster County, Pennsylvania rooster and some of the countryside there. Good morning. Just a wake up left before an estimated 80 million voters start deciding who will be president for the next four years. Richard Nixon, who's at the California White House to vote this morning in his home state, or George McGovern, who got home to South Dakota early this morning after a final campaign day that carried him more than 4,000 miles from coast to coast before it wound up in his home state. The polls ahead of today's voting already predict a wide margin for the president. UPI's survey indicating that McGovern will win only Massachusetts and the District of Columbia. The national weather for this election day is forecast to be pretty good. Mild temperatures in most places and some rain, but no forecast of winter-like storms. Dixville Notch, the mountain town in New Hampshire that votes right after midnight, went 16 to 3 for Nixon, that town backed losers in 1960, 1964, and 1968. The Air Force lost another $15 million F-111 over North Vietnam, the third one lost since the swing wings returned to the war less than six weeks ago. The two-man crew is missing. Today is Tuesday, November the 7th, the day in 1874 that Thomas Nast first cartooned an elephant as the symbol of the Republican Party. The Democratic donkey goes back a bit further to the campaign of 1828 and derives from one of Andrew Jackson's detractors calling him a jackass. Reports on the campaign wind-up coming up. On the CBS Morning News, with Nelson Benton in New York, substituting for John Hart, and Michelle Clark in Washington. Now, CBS News correspondent Nelson Benton. President Nixon is flying back to Washington after he votes this morning in California. He went on television briefly last night with a final campaign statement on the Vietnam issue. And peace in the world at large for a generation to come. As you know, we've made a breakthrough in the negotiations which will lead to peace in Vietnam. We have agreed on the major principles that I laid down in my speech to the nation of May 8th. We have agreed that there will be a ceasefire. We have agreed that our prisoners of war will, re will be returned and that the missing in action will be accounted for. And we have agreed that the people of South Vietnam shall have the right to determine their own future without having a communist government or a coalition government imposed upon them against their will. There are still some details that I am insisting be worked out and nailed down. Because I want this not to be a temporary peace. I want, and I know you want, it to be a lasting peace. But I can say to you with complete confidence tonight that we will soon reach agreement on all the issues and bring this long and difficult war to an end. You can help achieve that goal 
by your votes, you can send a message to those with whom we are negotiating and to the leaders of the world that you back the President of the United States in his insistence that we in the United States seek peace with honor and never peace with surrender. President Nixon has made his last campaign appearance as a candidate for public office, he says. Now he can help his bid for re-election only as much as any other citizen by voting for the candidate of his choice. For Mr. and Mrs. Nixon, the address of their polling place has a felicitous ring to it. 3120 Avenue of the President, San Clemente, California. The elementary school here, Concordia, is just two blocks from the Western White House, where the President spent the closing hours of what many have described as an unusually low-keyed campaign. Since his nomination, Mr. Nixon has personally campaigned in only 16 states. Instead, he has leaned heavily on national radio appeals, 15 paid political talks on 13 topics ranging from taxes to foreign policy. After they vote here, Mr. and Mrs. Nixon will fly back to Washington, where they will be joined by daughters Julie and Tricia and their husbands. The first family plans to receive the election results at the White House. If the results are good, as Mr. Nixon expects them to be, they will probably join their fellow Republicans at an election night celebration at a Washington hotel this evening. Al Walker, CBS News, with the Nixon campaign, San Clemente, California. George McGovern campaigned all the way across the country on his final day from New York to California and came halfway back home again to South Dakota. Bob Schieffer begins his report where McGovern met his followers in Wichita. The campaign has always been a sort of make the best of what you got kind of affair. So McGovern just told them he knew how much the farmers needed rain, and then he plunged into the crowd with the evangelical enthusiasm that he has maintained rain or shine for almost two years now. In so many ways, the last day was much like those first ones, with McGovern still on a nightmarish schedule, sometimes fighting to counter situations over which he had no control, always fighting the odds, but to the last predicting he would overcome them. He had already strolled down New York's Fifth Avenue and addressed a rally in Philadelphia before he got to Kansas, and in those last speeches, he was still talking about the war, the issue he has also stressed in the beginning. By the time he reached Long Beach, California last night, he was saying the administration had played politics with the peace of the world. Now see before us a record of deceit and deception on Vietnam that has ended with the worst deception of all, not a peace in the name of humanity, but a hoax for the sake of politics in the closing days of this campaign. And I use those words thoughtfully and carefully. Then it was back across the middle of the country and after a day that had covered 4,399 miles, home to Sioux Falls, South Dakota, and the last airport rally of the campaign. If he loses, he says he probably won't run again. He thinks he has done just about everything he can do to win this time, everything except vote. So he'll do that in a couple of hours, then wait and see who won. Bob Schieffer, CBS News, Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Vice President Agnew made his last stand-in campaign appearance for President Nixon in the friendly South. Barry Serafin reports from Richmond. His campaign finale was a rousing one. About 13,000 people packed the Richmond Coliseum, all but a handful of them enthusiastic Agnew fans. Agnew had addressed a Richmond crowd four years ago to the hour and told this crowd, said to be the biggest ever at a Virginia political gathering, that he expected history to repeat itself at the polls. The president's number one surrogate praised the Nixon record for the last four years and came down hard on George McGovern. He has lunged, he has lurched, he has flipped, and most certainly he has flopped. Indeed, it might be said that Senator McGovern, who characterizes himself as a populist, has ended up as a flopulist. He has failed to become a credible candidate. He has failed not only in his style, which is a combination of moralistic reprimands and rhetorical overkill, 
but he has failed in substance as well. His candidacy has progressed from disaster to disaster, flitting about from issue to issue, very much like a confused bee in search of a flower. Alas, Senator McGovern is doomed to buzz off into the footnotes of history, never having pollinated a single issue. In 72, Agnew's campaign has been almost a month shorter than in 68. He has traveled only half as far. He has visited only about half as many cities. The vice president says, even though his pace has been leisurely, he has gotten the administration's message across. And he says the administration is looking for 55% of the voter better, what he calls a clear mandate from the people. Mary Serafin, CBS News, Richmond, Virginia. Vice presidential candidate Sergeant Shriver was swinging around the lap two on his last campaign day, hitting five states, including Madison, Wisconsin, where he made a last-ditch attack on President Nixon's war and peace policies. Big tide rolling in our direction all the way from California to New Jersey, and it's going to sweep the country. The question is, I think, why has the tide turned in the last eight to ten days? I... <laughs> I suggest there are a number of reasons, but the first two reasons are these. Nixon has not only bungled the war, he has bungled the peace. <laughs> Tomorrow is the day when power is in your hands, and with that power, you can have George in the White House in Washington. Shriver ended the day with an unscheduled visit to former President Lyndon Johnson at the LBJ Ranch, where he said, we had a social visit, it was very fine. The third party presidential candidate, John Schmitz, wound up his campaign in San Francisco, sh shooting at the proposed draft peace agreement for Indochina. Schmitz, in a nationwide telecast, saying, it's not peace, it's a stab in the back or surrender. CBS News coverage of the election returns begins at 6.30 tonight, Eastern Time, with the CBS Evening News. The time now is 12 minutes past the hour. Simple pleasures are the best. All the little things that make you smile and glow. All the things you know. Like Van Camp's Pork and Beans. America's best seller. Because you know a good thing when you taste it. And Van Camp's tastes better to more people. Life's simple pleasures are the best. Van Camp's Pork and Beans. A great simple pleasure. The road ahead leads to more of America. So Greyhound announces a new way to see more of America. On 250 a day. The Greyhound Ameripass. See America. Canada too. Anytime. Discounts on hotels, sightseeing, other things. Good for 60 days of almost limitless travel. The Ameripass cost $149.50 or $250 a day. The Greyhound Ameripass. A new way to see more of America on $250 a day. At every turkey dinner, there's a moment of truth. How'd it turn out? Deep down, you'll be glad you picked Honeysuckle White. Basted deep down with rich turkey broth for moistness that stays in the meat. We hand-select only the broadest breasted turkeys for extra white meat. Oh, beautiful. Look for the turkey that's basted deep down with a rich turkey broth so it measures up to the moment of truth. Honeysuckle White. A special two-record collection by 101 Strings. Birthday priced at only $2. We wish you'd buy it, and we wish you'd listen to KPOL. <sighs> You'll find KPOL's album, 20 Years of Beautiful Music, at these stores.
Toys R Us, world's biggest toy stores. Meet Barry Williams, one of the Brady Bunch, Saturday, November 18th, across from the Los Cerritos Center. Toys R Us. Don't miss that delightful children's play, Jack and the Beanstalk, the fall production of the 9 o'clock players at the Assistance League Playhouse in Hollywood every weekend from October 28th through November 19th. For tickets, call Hollywood 91970. Special rates for scouts, Y groups, and others. KNBC Los Angeles. From NBC News election headquarters in New York, this is NBC Nightly News, Tuesday, November 7th. Reported by John Chancellor and David Brinkley. And good evening to you all as we begin our coverage of the 1972 election. David Brinkley and the rest of our team are here to cover the returns in contests for 435 seats in the House of Representatives, 33 in the Senate, and 18 governorships, and of course, the presidency. So let's begin with a look at the popular votes recorded so far for the presidency. With 1% of the vote in now, Mr. Nixon leading better than two to one, um, no, just about two to one over George McGovern. John Schmitz, the American Party candidate, small number of votes, and Dr. Benjamin Spock of the People's Party, an even smaller number. But this pattern that you see on your screen now, 65% for the president, 34% for McGovern, although it's very early in the evening, is close to what some of the polls were showing and some of the polls were indicating in various states. We had a heavy turnout today in most of the populous states, and it looks like around the country there were many, many people who voted. It looks like a heavy turnout. In Michigan, there were long lines. In New York City and upstate, there were long lines of voters. In Illinois, the voters went through cold and often rainy weather to go to the polls in record numbers. In Ohio, they extended the hours in some polling places because of trouble with voting machines, but there was a heavy vote there, and they're talking about record numbers of voters turning out in California. Leaders of both parties today, both the Republicans and the Democrats, said that was good news to them. Uh, Senator McGovern's people said they were finding very good turnouts in places where they expected support, and so did the Republican national chairman. NBC News has three winners declared so far in this election, and David Brinkley will report on them. We, we will, of course, keep you up to date all night on the popular vote, as you have just seen, that is, people in voting booths. We, uh, we have been able to project three states the outcome in three states. They give Mr. Nixon 32 electoral votes. As everyone knows, but often forgets, it is electoral votes that elect somebody president. The three states are Tennessee, where we project that Mr. Nixon will win with 68% of the vote. Kentucky, where we project 61% for Nixon, and Indiana, 64 percent. That's three states settled so far. As everyone knows but often forgets, it takes 270 to elect anyone president to make you the most powerful person on earth. And so in this country today, those were eagerly sought little nuggets. When we have 270 votes, we will have the winner. And when we do, you'll be the first to know. John? One final note, uh, Harry's Bar in Paris, a gathering place for expatriate Americans, held its annual straw poll today. Richard Nixon got 56% of the vote. Don't laugh, Harry's Bar has not been wrong in one of these straw polls since 1924. NBC Nightly News is brought to you by Geno's. At Geno's, we don't care who you... This is Gino's new service slice tray. In it, Gino's new frozen pizza, pizzeria-style pizza. The special tray holds nine separate slices. The pizza is special, more cheese and sauce, more of everything that makes pizzeria pizza good, about a dollar less than you'd pay in a pizzeria. Gino's makes it easy to enjoy pizzeria-style pizza from your own freezer. A new concept in pizza from Gino's. Go, get up, get up! There it is, there it is! <laughs> it wasn't unexpected that Mike won again. After all, Mike carries a four handicap. But when he popped for the beer... Winners by... Oh, hey, hey, that was unexpected. 
Michelob, the one beer so good, people are pleasantly surprised when you serve it. Surprise people, serve Michelob. For a cleaner America, pitch in. President and Mrs. Nixon voted today in San Clemente, California. They were applauded by a small crowd as they drove up to the Concordia Elementary School, two blocks from the Western White House. And they were the first to vote today in the school. Richard Valeriani reports. To vote at precisely 7 a.m. when the polls opened. Their voting place was the library of the Concordia Elementary School, about a half mile from the Western White House in San Clemente. The president spent more than five minutes in the voting booth, filling out a newspaper-sized ballot that contained 26 state and local propositions, including a referendum on legalizing marijuana. Mr. Nixon carried his home state in both 1960 and 1968, and he's favored to do it again, with heavily Republican Orange County supplying much of the margin. After casting his ballot, Mr. Nixon gave presidential pens to the election officials. The Nixons then flew back to Washington for a family dinner with their two daughters and sons-in-law at the White House, where they'll watch the election returns on television. The president is also expected to show up at a victory celebration at a Washington hotel later tonight. This event represented a landmark of sorts on the American political scene. Richard Nixon has been a rather controversial part of that scene for 26 years, and he expects to be around for four more years. But this was his last appearance as a candidate for public office, and someday there may be a plaque here at this school to commemorate the occasion. Richard Valeriani, NBC News, with the President in California. This is the ballroom in Washington where the Republicans plan their big victory party and the loud music already is underway. This is where both President Nixon and Vice President Agnew are expected later tonight. It's a party for about 5,000 people invited by the White House, by the committee to re-elect the president, and by the Republican National Committee. To say that people around here are confident is an understatement. The White House already has spread the word they expect to carry 48 states with only Massachusetts and West Virginia in doubt. I've been traveling with Vice President Agnew, and last night on the airplane coming back from his final rally in Richmond, Virginia, there was a chance to chat with some of the people who will be at this party tonight. And one of them told me that weeks before, they had already ruled out any possibility of ever losing this election. So they really felt it was over before it started. This is Tom Pettit, NBC News, at Republican headquarters in Washington. For George McGovern, the long campaign for the presidency ended this morning when he and Mrs. McGovern voted in the basement of a church in his hometown in South Dakota. John Dancy has a report. Senator McGovern voted today in the Congregational Church in his hometown of Mitchell, South Dakota. McGovern flew home to South Dakota early this morning after one last exhausting day of campaigning that took him all the way across the country from New York to California. You're so good to be here. Appreciate it. That you never change. It's good to see you. With him as he voted this morning, as she has been throughout most of the campaign, was his wife, Ellen. How are you? The government voted a straight Democratic ticket, so he thought he'd made a wise choice. He spent part of the day talking to students at his alma mater, Dakota Wesleyan University, before returning to Sioux Falls to watch the results come in. <laughs> this is where 22 months of campaigning will end for George McGovern, underneath this rainbow in the Municipal Coliseum in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. It's here that later this evening McGovern will come to make either his victory or concession statement. At this point, most people are speculating it will be a concession statement because the McGovern campaign, by its own admission, is in real trouble. Throughout the campaign, the McGovern forces have concentrated their efforts in a dozen or so states and more or less conceded the rest of the country to the Republicans. Here's their assessment of how they're doing in those dozen states or so. They think they have a good chance in California, Wisconsin, Massachusetts, South Dakota, the District of Columbia, and surprisingly, Arkansas, where party leaders are working hard for the ticket. They list as questionable big states like Illinois, Michigan, Ohio, and Texas, and they say they have some real problems in New York and Pennsylvania. 
So it's not too hopeful a picture. Four of the must-win states are now listed as questionable, and two of them are doubtful. But whatever the outcome, the governor feels he has run a good race, he's done everything possible to win, and now tonight he waits to see if it was enough. John Dancy, NBC News, at McGovern headquarters in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Sergeant Shriver cast his ballot in Rockville, Maryland, the Washington suburb where he lives, and Spiro Agnew voted at his hometown in suburban Baltimore. Ron Nesson reports on both candidates. Agnew and his wife voted at an elementary school in Towson, Maryland. Towson in Baltimore County is the Agnew's legal residence, and it's where Agnew got his start in politics when he was elected county executive 10 years ago. Agnew jokingly declined to confirm that he voted Republican, and he would not predict how the election will come out, but he did tell one reason why he thinks the polls show McGovern far behind. Different things, different issues affected different areas, and uh, certainly uh, uh, the idea that uh, McGovern uh, was criticizing the foreign policy of the country, which has never been done, I think hurt him very badly. Agnew will follow the returns tonight at Republican election headquarters in Washington. Shriver and his wife voted at a high school near their rented estate in Rockville, Maryland, a suburb of Washington. The Shrivers did not return home from the last campaign stops in Texas until 5 a.m., so they slept late and did not get to the polls until mid-afternoon. They voted the straight Democratic ticket. Shriver complained that the real issues were not discussed enough in the campaign and the polls were discussed too much. I'd like to uh, continue to discuss the issues because I don't think the issues really ever got discussed enough. Never really did. Why was that? It seems to me that I spent more time talking about whether the polls were right or wrong and whether unemployment was up or down or whether it could go up lower or whether war and peace was handled right. Nearly all the time it was a question of the polls. Shriver will make his concession or victory statement at Democratic election headquarters in Washington. Ron Nesson, NBC News, Rockville, Maryland. Senator McGovern said today that the Columbia Broadcasting System may not broadcast from his election night headquarters in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Technicians at CBS have been on strike there for four days. Earlier, the network said it would confine, confine its on-the-spot coverage to the two major presidential candidates, but now McGovern has said, as far as he's concerned, the answer is no. It will be hours before all the polls everywhere are closed, but more, some more of the votes are in, and we'll have a look at them in just a moment. Now let's have a look at the popular vote board to see where we stand. Again, 1%, but the, they're pouring in now. President Nixon maintaining the lead we saw earlier, 65% of the vote as of now against 34% for George McGovern. And that, of course, is John Schmitz of the American Party, whose name you see there, and Benjamin Spock of the People's Party. Let's look at our individual state vote tally board now uh, to see some of the returns coming in from various states around the country. New Hampshire, 2% in. President Nixon still well ahead, 66%. Tennessee's 10 electoral votes, as David told you, we have awarded to the president. He's now got 71% of the vote tallied so far. Tennessee is a state he carried the last time with 37%. And in Kentucky, another state we have awarded to the president, a sizable vote in, and you can see he again maintaining that average we've seen tonight of 65%. Now we're going to talk to some of our other correspondents here covering various races, and to begin with, Garrick Utley, who's covering the Senate. And John, we have a winner in the Senate in the state of Tennessee. It is Republican incumbent Howard Baker. We project that he will win tonight with 57% of the vote. The current standing in that Tennessee race shows that Baker is running ahead of his opponent, Democratic Congressman Ray Blanton. He currently has 60%. That's with 9% of the precincts in. It's interesting to note that with a projected 57% as his final total there, he is running behind. And now back to John. I think we may get larger totals in Dale Bumper's race here tonight as we go along. Six votes to seven votes may not tell us a lot, but the rest of the figures will, and we'll be back with those in a minute.
You know how to tell good tomatoes. You look for firm onions and meat that's juicy and red. These are things that go into spaghetti sauce. But how do you tell a good spaghetti sauce? One way is to look at it. This is Chef Boyardee. You can see it's rich and thick with tomatoes. You can see chopped onions and the lean ground meat. Chef Boyardee spaghetti sauce. You can see how good it is. Any new catalogs? Balloons for the kids. What is this? It's the 73 Old Cutlass S. It's all new. How did you do that? New swivel buckets, if you order them. Not as much as I expected. Marge, I love this. No, 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 keep the balloons for your cue. Holy cow! You'd believe it if your friends could see you now. Two of the races that have come in early this evening that we have already called involve states where Mr. Nixon has done fairly well before, Indiana and Kentucky. Douglas Kiker, who will be handling the analysis desk for us tonight, is going to tell us something about those two states. Doug? Both these states, Indiana and Kentucky, are worth looking at because both states have a modern habit of voting Republican in presidential elections. Both Indiana and Kentucky went for President Nixon in 1960 and in 68. So if he had not done well there, it would have provided the first tip-off that he was in trouble. On the other hand, the margins he is receiving can provide us with a first opening clue as to what could happen during the rest of the night. And the fact is the president is doing very well in both states. In Indiana, he is taking 56% of the blue-collar vote. That's an increase of 21% over four years ago. And Hubert Humphrey won the blue-collar vote. The president in Indiana is taking 66% of the white vote. That's a 14% increase. And he's taking 12% of the black vote. Not much, but an increase of 6%. In Kentucky, the president is doing well all over the state. He's doing well in the cities, where he's carrying the cities by 58%. In the towns, he's taking 68% of the vote, 64% in the rural areas. In the Cumberland Mountain areas, 78% of the votes. And it's really in the suburbs, where he is clobbering Senator McGovern, where he is taking 72% of the vote. What it all adds up to is a resounding victory by the president in both states. In both cases, a victory that was expected. This is Douglas Kiker. Now to John Chancellor. There is other news today, and here is some of it. And the American Military Command in Saigon reported the disappearance of another F-111 fighter today, somewhere over North Vietnam. Two crewmen were reported missing. The plane was the third F-111 lost since they were sent back to the war six weeks ago. In Moscow, the Soviet Union celebrated the 55th anniversary of the revolution. There was the usual military parade, but Western experts saw no new weapons. East and West Germany today agreed on a treaty which will ease relations between the two. It will be initial tomorrow in Bonn, an important story. Meyer Lansky, the underworld gambling magnate, landed in Miami today and was arrested by FBI agents. He had been forced out of Israel, then denied asylum by half a dozen Latin American countries. He is wanted for income tax evasion, and his bail, which he put up, was $250,000. The British wage price freeze started today. An angry consumers charged that prices have been going up for weeks in anticipation of that freeze. And in Washington, the Supreme Court ruled unanimously today that a man who was fired for refusing to cross fellow strikers' picket lines must be given his job back. The case grew out of a California movers' strike. Hi, I'm David Fry for Addressograph Multigraph. I copy famous people who might sound like this while shopping for office machines to open a business together. Golly, we could put this brooding PG-80 white printer right in our drafting room. Smells fresh as a daisy. And this AM-5000 copier is the real crowd stopper in every office. Gives you the fastest 15 copies ever. Let us not confuse our priorities. First, we're going to need... To the popular tally again tonight. Uh, again, 1%. The president edging up a little bit now. Almost exactly twice the size of Senator McGovern's vote, the minority parties being minority parties in that tally. We are going now to Catherine Mackin for a report on an important governor's race.
Now, we have a projected winner. Uh, this is very interesting. In Indiana, the Republican, Dr. Otis Boeing, we are projecting the winner with 54% of the vote. That was a very close race there between Matthew Welsh, the Democrat who was once governor of Indiana back in 1960. He defied uh, the Republican move there. Uh, it's, Indiana is a strong Republican state and managed to get elected, but this time he wasn't able to do it. Bowen apparently made inroads into the black vote, into the blue-collar vote, and ran strong in the northern industrial area of Indiana. And now back to John. Uh, we have just had a declaration here. We declare President Nixon the winner in the state of Ohio with 58% of the vote in that state. That's doing better than he did the last time when George Wallace was running. He carried the state with 45%. The Ohio is up on our board now, and you can see that uh, 62 to 36% of the vote for the president, um, that is what we have so far in Ohio. David, how does it look to you? I, I've gathered that we're going to get fairly high turnout in this election and quite a lot of ticket splitting. Well, the ticket splitting we can't really tell about yet, or at least I can't. You may have something or I don't. In any case, what is interesting so far is to note that in the first three states where we were able to call the winners, states where the polls close early, beginning at 4 o'clock in Tennessee, 6 o'clock in Indiana, and 6 in Kentucky. In uh, Kentucky, for example, we project Mr. Nixon will get 64% of the vote. It is interesting to note that in 1968, Mr. Nixon and Wallace together got 62%. In Tennessee, we've projected 68%. In that state in 68, Wallace and Nixon together got 71%. In Indiana, we have project, projected 64. In that state in 68, Nixon and Wallace got 62. I don't, I'm not sure what that proves except that Mr. Nixon is now coming in with as many votes as he and Wallace together got four years ago, plus another percentage point or two. Well, one of the stories we'll be able to cover tonight is the Wallace vote. It's there. He got 13% of the vote nationally the last time, and those voters are going somewhere. We know in some cases they are going to President Nixon as heavily as 10 to 1, in other places less so. So that's where we stand now. The counting is underway in some states. The polls are open in others. The biggest story of the year, and we'll be back in a minute to cover it. On the 6.30 movie tomorrow, Raquel Welch in the Los Angeles television premiere of Flare Up. See it on Channel 7. You still have time to vote. We are canceling all our regular programs for the next eight hours so that ABC News can bring you full coverage of the 1972 elections. ABC News presents complete nationwide coverage of tonight's Election 72. Brought to you by J.C. Penney. Tomorrow morning, our 1,700 stores and our catalog will be waiting to help you find what you're looking for. Now from election headquarters in New York, the anchormen of the ABC Evening News, Harry Reasoner and Howard K. Smith. Good evening. Well, at last, the long wait is over. Tonight, we find out whether the pollsters were right and there's going to be a Nixon landslide, partly right, he'll win a modest victory, or whether they were wrong and McGovern's going to win. As you can see, we already have some popular votes up on our board, with 1% of the nation's precincts having reported in. Nixon has 66% of the votes counted so far. These come mainly from three states, Indiana, Kentucky, and Tennessee. And uh, McGovern, 33%. We also have a state result, a result in the presidential election, in the presidential election in the state of Indiana. Nixon is the winner of Indiana's 13 electoral votes by projection from the result in key precincts. To repeat, Nixon carries Indiana, no surprise. And another no surprise so far in the state of Kentucky in the presidential race. 
President of ABC News pre projects that Nixon will win that state with 48% of the uh, precincts reported. Actually, he has 65% of the vote. Uh, he carried it in, um, in 1968, but by a much smaller margin, and of course that's because there was George Wallace there. One of the things we'll be doing in uh, uh, tonight's coverage of the elections is to keep a kind of running total of electoral votes. And since uh, Mr. Nixon has won Indiana and Kentucky, according to ABC News projection, he has won 22 of the magic figure of 270. Mr. McGovern has won none and would not be expected to in these early reports which come from Nixon states. I suppose we should explain what um, we're talking about when we say projection. I think we're better because we're going to be projecting fast and a lot in many states in the next hour and a half to two hours. Throughout the evening, we'll use that word projections, and uh, we'll use it in respect to Senate and governor races, as well as projections on how the states vote for the presidency. These determinations are made by political experts at our decision desk. Their goal is speed and accuracy, but with a heavy em emphasis on accuracy. As in past elections, our policy tonight will be to wait until the polls are closed in a state before we make any projected results for that state. We'll project the presidential winner whenever the total number of projected electoral votes passes 270, whether all the polls are closed or not. That will have to happen after 8 o'clock here in the East, when many of the polls will be closed. There's no evidence, whatever, that projections have any effect on people who've not yet voted, but by waiting until the polls close, we can be absolutely sure we're reporting the results and not influencing them. We will not make projections for the House of Representatives. Those apparent winners will be determined by the raw vote. Now I would like to call your attention to the uh, presidential race, the raw vote, not the projection. We have projected that uh, Indiana has been won by President Nixon, but here's the way the raw vote looks in the presidential race in Indiana. In the presidential race in Indiana, President Nixon leads, as you can see by the... Uh, the uh, figures there, only 12% of the precincts are in, but they include our key precincts, which tell us that Nixon's going to win. Now for one close race in the Senate in the state of Kentucky. In the state of Kentucky, it's been a ding-dong race all of this short evening so far between Democrat Walter Huddleston and Republican Louis Nunn. Each has 50%, and that's the way it's gone, and it may go that way all the way through the evening. That's one of those Kentucky senator races that you get used to over the years. They seem to, whatever they feel nationally, they always make it close on senator. As might be expected with ABC News projecting President Nixon taking Indiana's presidential votes, uh, the Republican Otis Bowen, a candidate for governor, is also the apparent winner over Democrat Matthew Welch, a former governor in Indiana. He's running ahead by a healthy 18%. Uh, ABC News now does predict that Otis Bowen, who is Speaker of the State House of Representatives, not as well known as the man he ran against, but has supported President Nixon's policies, and it's apparently doing him a substantial amount of good. ABC News predicts that's the first governor. We're talking tonight about uh, 18 races for governor with 20 Democratic holdovers and 12 Republicans who don't have to run for anything. Uh, the former re uh, governor in Indiana, Edgar Whitcomb, was also a Republican, so so far in the net gain area, there is no net gain. One Republican has held one Republican seat. One of the things we're going to be doing tonight is to look around the country at where the people are who are uh, critically affected by this election or who will be coming out with victory or concession statements. We will, for instance, uh, maintain cameras and reporters and correspondents in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. This is the first time in history that anybody has maintained cameras in Sioux Falls, South Dakota to see what a presidential candidate would say. This is where George McGovern is spending the evening. He voted earlier today in Mitchell, which is his nominal home, but Sioux Falls is the biggest town in South Dakota. And this is the uh, place where the victory celebrations or the concession statement will come. Sooner or later, we'll also be at the Shoreham Hotel in New York, where uh, President Nixon, who is watching television after a family dinner in the White House, will go to make his move. If you've ever been unhappy with your car for any reason, Ford Motor Company and 6,283 Ford and Lincoln Mercury dealers have an important announcement for you. If you want a Ford Mercury or Lincoln, they want to make sure that you stay happy with it. The goal is no unhappy owners. And the next time you go into one of these dealers, you find some new ways of doing business. Suppose you have a problem with your car. You take it to your dealer. He'll do everything within reason to solve it. And 
Most of the time, he will. So you see the dealer first. But if for some reason he can't solve your problem, Ford Motor Company has formed an exclusive new customer service division with 34 offices around the country. Now, their primary job is to try to straighten out problems you and the dealer can't. For the address of the Ford Customer Service Division office nearest you, call this toll-free number. It's 800-648-4848. The goal is no unhappy owners. They really mean it. I'd like to prove it to you. The CBS News estimate uh, has been able to uh, say that Indiana has fallen definitely into its uh, normal Republican habits tonight, and uh, Dan Rather from the Midwest has the story. Walter, as you know, Indiana is considered the most southern of the Midwestern states, one time bastion of the Ku Klux Klan and a traditionally Republican state. No surprise that uh, CBS News estimates that President Nixon has carried Indiana. Uh, there may be a mild surprise, though, in the length of the president's coattails. The CBS, uh, first of all, the figures in the presidential race, uh, the CBS News estimate is that the president's final margin in Indiana may be on the order of 67%. Now, let's take a look at the figures in the Indiana governor's race, which was expected to be very close, with 12% of the precincts reporting. Uh, this is the president's uh, margin over George McGovern, but since uh, our CBS News estimate is that uh, the president's winning margin will be on the order of 67%, those figures don't mean a great deal, except they do reinforce the idea that the Nixon sweep is running very deep in Indiana. Now, if we look at that governor's race, the Indiana governor's race uh, was expected to be extremely close. It's an open governor's race. Uh, Matthew Welch, a former governor, the Democrat, who in the face of a President Nixon uh, carrying Indiana in 1960, Welch, the Democrat, won the Indiana governorship. However, this year, in an attempt to come back, not to, for a consecutive term, but to come back, our CBS News estimate is that the Republican, Otis Bowen, a physician and the uh, majority leader of the Indiana House, has uh, won the Indiana gubernatorial race, and the final margin will be on the order of 59%. Now, to translate that into coattail terms as to what it may mean for the rest of the evening, it now appears that at least one and perhaps more uh, Democratic House members in Indiana may be in some trouble. For example, in the 11th District, incumbent Democrat Andrew Jacobs with 16% of the vote in and counted, trails by about uh, 62 to 38% behind William Hudnut, the Republican challenger. It appears that in Indiana, the president's coattails may indeed be long, and there may be one or more Democratic House seats change hands, change parties in Indiana. I've just been handed a note that says that President Nixon uh, has won in Ohio with about 60% of the vote according to our CBS News estimate. The polls closed in Ohio less than an hour ago, but on the basis of our sample precincts, CBS News estimates that President Nixon has carried Ohio with about 60% of the vote. Now again, that is a larger margin than the McGovern people uh, had expected even when they were willing to talk about uh, defeat, and it may also mean in Ohio, we'll see as the evening goes along, that some Democratic House members could be in trouble in Ohio as well. Walter? That uh, total now is four states for President Nixon, according to a CBS News estimate, Kentucky, Indiana, Tennessee, and Ohio. That gives him a total of some 57 electoral votes, uh, and uh, uh, that is on the way toward the 270 he needs for re-election. All of those uh, totals, over 60%, including, as Dan pointed out, Ohio, which was a state where Senator McGovern had campaigned hard and long and had hoped to uh, do very well, perhaps uh, even uh, have a chance to win. If that uh, sort of figure continues across the country, it would indicate that the landslide uh, that had been predicted uh, will develop for President Nixon, a landslide perhaps of historic proportions. Uh, to be uh, the largest landslide in our modern history. He'd have to get better than 61% of the vote to beat uh, President uh, Johnson's 1964 victory over Senator Goldwater. And he has to uh, get uh, uh, all of the electoral vote votes, uh, save eight. Uh, that was the uh, record in 1936 of uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt over Alf Landon. When uh, did vote during the past I mean, week, uh, during the past 24 hours. My name is Ron Rosen. I'm an eye doctor here in Columbus, Ohio. And I voted for Richard Nixon. And the best reason I could give, I guess, is that I'm basically a conservative, uh, a law and order man, if you wish. And I feel that we've got 
problems here at home that are far more serious than the Vietnam War, be that sacrilegious if it sounds that way. And I'm just afraid to put a liberal in the White House. And uh, maybe it's because of my advanced years, but I'm just a conservative. Tony? My name is Tony King, and I'm a student and part-time secretary. And I voted for Senator George McGovern because I believe of the two candidates, he offers the best policies for the American people. Very quickly. My name is Lawrence Gill. I'm an optometrist in in Columbus, Ohio here, and I voted for George McGovern. I think I may have had a better defense if I had voted for Richard Nixon, but when I went into the voting booth, I voted my conscience. Those are three voters. At least two of them were undecided uh, as recently as just a few days ago when I talked to them. Perhaps later in the evening we'll find out just why. That's it from ABC's Election City. Harry, I think this is the time to remind people there are about 13 presidential candidates. I think you can see four of them on this board we have here. Uh, President Nixon, uh, George McGovern, John Schmitz, the AIP candidate, and Dr. Spock from the left of center. Neither of the, uh, the other two nor any of the other seven or uh, whatever it would be seem to be at the moment any real threat. I guess uh, it's been, uh, as opposed to 1968, this is not a third party thing. We do have an additional projection. ABC News projects that President Nixon will take Mississippi and its seven electoral votes, uh, which will give him a total now of 29 electoral votes to none for Senator McGovern. Uh, this, again, is nothing that was a surprise. Mississippi this year is very definitely Nixon country. And that's the national election story at 22 minutes after the hour. Election 72 continues from Los Angeles. Now complete California coverage from the Eyewitness News Election Center with Joseph Benny, John Schubeck, and the Eyewitness News team. Good evening. We hope that you're prepared for a long evening. We are. We plan to be here at least until midnight, perhaps on until 1 or 2 o'clock in the morning, bringing you all the returns from California, and combining that, of course, with ABC Network's coverage of the national elections of 1972. Los Angeles is important uh, to how California goes because some three and a half million registered voters in the state of California, where there are nine million registered voters, live in Los Angeles County, and more than half of those nine million voters live in Southern California. That makes us important, and that's why our coverage, I think, is going to be important for you tonight. We look forward to election coverages because it's that one time every four years when we can get to do a marathon job and have a feeling that we cover the story at least to its conclusion. We have no illusions. Uh, we think that by about 7 o'clock here in California, before our polls even close, ABC, NBC, CBS will all have told you who they think the president is going to be. It appears now that that landslide that was forecast for Richard Nixon, the incumbent, is going on as forecast, and he should win easily. And uh, we don't think California is going to go against that grain, probably follow the nation, but the percentages will be a little different. Our major interest, of course, will be what goes on in those local offices, assembly offices, the propositions which have created so much controversy in homes and uh, in public places among Californians. That's what we'll be covering. John has a more thorough uh, analysis of our coverage for the night. So, John, you want to get into that? Well, thank you very much, Joe. We will have inserts in the network programming every 30 minutes. We are now coming up at about 25 past the hour. We'll be on again at about 55 after the hour and throughout the night until it's all over. And among the eyewitness news correspondents who will be helping us on this coverage this evening will be these. Reporter Larry Badger, our man normally in Sacramento, is here with us in the studio tonight to keep us abreast on how all the Assembly and Senate races, which of course influence much of what happens ultimately in the state of California in the next couple of years, will turn out tonight. Dick Carlson will report on all of the county races. Bernard Morris will keep us posted on these emotionally charged propositions, which there are 22 on the election ballot today. Andy Park will zero in on the key races in Orange, San Bernardino, and Riverside counties. And Christine Lunn will report on the congressional races as well as a complex computer analysis of all of what is going on. And we'll have more of this election coverage in the state of California after this commercial message. Five of the finest cars in America are the 1973 Continentals. We previewed them for these men and women who last May judged a ride test between the 72 Continental and the other 72 luxury car. These judges all own the other luxury car. 
Yet 60 out of 100 of them picked the Continental over their own make of car. Let us show you our 73s as they saw them. Our Lincoln Continental four-door sedan and coupe, designed for an even more comfortable ride than our 72. Our 73 Lincoln Continental town cars, the sedan, the new town coupe. The 1973 Continental Mark IV, newly minted in silver. Introducing the 1973 Continentals. It is a very good year. About 3% of the vote, that's in terms of what you know, but in terms of the rosy predictions here, there have been briefings in which Herbert Klein, the White House Communications Director, has said that he expects 48 states for President Nixon. Uh, the only ones he said were in doubt were Massachusetts and West Virginia. And Harry Dent, the White House Southern strategist, said no, West Virginia is going to be in, which makes 49. They attributed this to the uh, landslide, uh, to the whole um, uh, large turnout at the polls. They expect to have as many as 85 million votes, which is considerably better than the 73 million in 1968 and the 70 and a half million in 1964. One interesting thing, Harry Dent says that he expects that after the election, several Southern senators and congressmen will switch their affiliation to the Republican Party so that if the Republicans don't pick up the necessary seats to organize Congress, they'll be able to do so by some switches. He wouldn't mention names. He denied there were any deals. Could be Senator Eastland, could be Senator Byrd of Virginia, now independent. But there appears to be something in the making about a switch of parties by some of the nominal Democrats in the South. With me is Michelle Clark who is looking at the scene out here as they get ready for the victory celebration with President Nixon and Vice President Agnew. Michelle? Well, apparently the only, uh, the only plans here have always been for a victory celebration. The, the point is just how large the victory is going to be. The bands have been playing here for an hour. There's talk that the president should arrive here sometime before midnight. Uh, his cabinet members, all of the, the people in the party are expected to be here. Um, there, are a lot of, there should be a lot of young people. There are, there are two kinds of bands. There's Pete Fountain, and then there's a rock band for the younger people. Uh, we'll wait and see right now. There's not much room for enthusiasm, except when the announcements are made. There's a big screen over our shoulders that show all of the networks telling you exactly what we're projecting. And there's a cheer that goes up, of course, every time there's something said about a big landslide victory here. And that's all we've got from you now. Walter? Now for the scene of McGovern headquarters, let's go to Bruce Morton at the Coliseum in Sioux Falls, South Dakota. Bruce? for election night and uh, once they volunteer to do all the artwork why a couple of local families have volunteered to put them up where the returns have been going uh, i don't know maybe it's not a rainbow maybe it's a sunset but uh, that be as it may uh, this place is very empty as you can see the reason is not that senator mcgovern lacks friends in south dakota he has lots of them the reason is that uh, the secret service uh, until just a few minutes ago had been sweeping the coliseum here uh, uh, not that they'd had any warnings, but simply the standard kind of security check that they do any time uh, the candidate goes somewhere. Uh, that process just ended a few minutes ago. Senator McGovern himself, uh, as you know, went to Mitchell, South Dakota, to vote today. Uh, stopped by on the way back at a family-owned shoe store in Mitchell and bought himself two pairs of shoes, uh, some black loafers and a pair of boots, the first boots he said he'd ever owned. Uh, it's not any kind of an election day tradition. One of the owners of the store said uh, they just seem to know McGovern's size, and uh, quite often when he's in Mitchell, he stops by and does a little business there. We drove back from there uh, here to Sioux Falls. It's just under a 70-mile drive. McGovern went to one more reception here, which makes him uh, an unusually active candidate for an election day, and uh, then went from there for some quiet time in the hotel where he's staying. Uh, he doesn't have a house here in Sioux Falls, just a small apartment over his office in Mitchell. Uh, he's having dinner, we're told, watching three television sets, uh, impartially, one to each network. And uh, just in the far corner of this room, uh, past the stage there, there's a little holding room with some more television sets, a couch or two, some easy chairs. And that's uh, where he'll be coming eventually to wait and uh, get a final look at the returns before he comes out and talks to his supporters here. 
We are told that is not likely to happen anytime very early. Uh, uh, not that McGovern uh, doesn't believe in projections, but he wants to wait and uh, let the raw vote uh, pile up for a while before he does anything. There'll be some music here later on. It's very quiet now. Walter? Bruce, we were uh, told earlier that uh, in that Mr. Berg shoe store uh, where he bought those two pairs of shoes, he was extended credit. I gather he has been in the past, but uh, today I guess that's a vote of confidence at any rate that uh, he didn't come out of the campaign too badly off financially. Well, I think uh, on a senator's salary you can afford a couple pairs of shoes. They're not, uh, they're not badly paid. <laughs> All right, Bruce. The uh, uh, reports from around the country now, uh, as we have been reporting them to you, indicate that uh, President Nixon certainly is going to win and probably with a record margin of votes, perhaps over that 61.8 that uh, President uh, Johnson was reelected by in 1964 over Barry Goldwater. CBS News coverage of election night 72 will continue in a moment. And in West Virginia, a Rockefeller who is a Democrat, John D. Rockefeller IV, calls himself J. Rockefeller, is trying to defeat Arch Moore. Moore is uh, trying to be elected to his second term as governor of West Virginia, and he's been a politician in West Virginia for a long time and has always been rather popular. In both of those uh, states, Illinois and West Virginia, the uh, races are so close that none of the poll takers or the experts uh, would call how they would come out. We don't have any returns yet from those two states, but we do have live reports. Uh, first, in West Virginia, Steve Delaney. John D. Rockefeller IV has gone a long way since he first appeared here as a social worker eight years ago. He's now Secretary of State and the Democratic candidate for governor of West Virginia. The polls say he has a razor-thin edge over Arch Moore, the Republican incumbent. Moore has been a popular governor and a tough opponent. The future of strip mining is quite an issue here, and so is the condition of the state's road system. But in a sense, the issue has been Jay Rockefeller. He's been called a New York carpetbagger. He's been called a rich man trying to buy his way into office. He has spent money on this campaign. He's used it to get around and become quite well known throughout the state. But he's put up most of the money himself. As he says, it's difficult for a Rockefeller to go out and solicit contributions. He is barely favored by those who hope around here at his headquarters to take it. But he is not the only rich man facing an entrenched incumbent. There's a similar race going on in Illinois for governor, and Dick Kay is covering that one. 